people think a church is all about what happens on the stage every weekend, but we know it goes way beyond that. There's that woman who faithfully holds babies in the nursery week in and week out. Plus, there's that couple who gently leads younger couples, helping them figure out all that a marriage really can be. Plus, there's that guy who's always up for driving a minivan full of teenagers to their next youth event. Plus, there are key leaders who make visionary decisions about the direction of the church and are just fine with serving outside of the spotlight. Plus, the guys and gals who run sound and make sure that the right words are on the screen at the right time. Plus, the good people filling the seats who may or may not have their act all together. Side note, no one has their act all together. Add to that the man who arrived early today to pray with anticipation over every empty seat, a seat that would be filled by you today. We could go on, but you get the idea. When these less than perfect people are all added together, we're left with a special place full of special people. It's a group of people who are all figuring out how best to follow Jesus so that our lives leave his residue behind in every location and in every conversation. And somewhere in the middle of all this imperfection, we believe that God is smiling and that the bride of Christ is being revealed as beautiful and redemptive in spite of her flaws. And together, we're becoming something that God simply calls church. So can we count you in? So can we count you? Am I on? Hello? Hello? Okay. My favorite thing about that video, and I've watched it a dozen or two times this week, is I don't know if you're aware of it or if you know this or not, but every single thing mentioned in that video happens in this church every single Sunday. Every single Sunday. When I watch through that video, I put names in there of all these people who are doing these things. So we're going to do something just slightly different this morning. I'm going to ask the media team to play it again. And when you watch it again, I want you to put those names to those faces because those people are here and serving behind the scenes all over the place. And then at the end of the service, I want you to go find those people and just tell them thank you. So let's watch it one more time. Most people think a church is all about what happens on the stage every weekend, but we know it goes way beyond that. There's that woman who faithfully holds babies in the nursery week in and week out. Plus, there's that couple who gently leads younger couples, helping them figure out all that a marriage really can be. Plus, there's that guy who's always up for driving a minivan full of teenagers to their next youth event. Plus, there are key leaders who make visionary decisions about the direction of the church and are just fine with serving outside of the spotlight. Plus, the guys and gals who run sound and make sure that the right words are on the screen at the right time. Plus, the good people filling the seats who may or may not have their act all together. Side note, no one has their act all together. Add to that the man who arrived early today to pray with anticipation over every empty seat a seat that would be filled by you today. We could go on, but you get the idea. When these less than perfect people are all added together, we're left with a special place full of special people. It's a group of people who are all figuring out how best to follow Jesus so that our lives leave his residue behind in every location and in every conversation. And somewhere in the middle of all this imperfection, we believe that God is smiling and that the bride of Christ is being revealed as beautiful and redemptive in spite of her flaws. And together, we're becoming something that God simply calls church. So can we count you in? So did you get it? Did you get those people? At the end of the service, you guys go tell them thank you. There's so much that happens in this place uh, that people don't even know. Uh, and so we're thankful for those of you that serve. So Kyle came in my office a couple of weeks ago, and he said, so what do you think about preaching on the 17th? And I said, uh, if you want a sermon on tithing from the administrative pastor, that's great. Um, but uh, so 
I was thinking about maybe in my position, I'm the numbers guy, so we're going to preach out of the book of Numbers, or, you know, if you're a numbers person, the book of Numbers still isn't all that satisfying. Um, but I asked him, I said, so what do you want me to do? And he said, I want you to preach. Like, okay, so I'm preaching. And so it's been years uh, since I've stood in a pulpit and preached like this. Um, I would much rather stand up here probably and sing or play the piano or give a some kind of report, probably. Um, it's just a little more natural to me. So excuse me if I'm a hair nervous this morning. It's been a little while. Uh, Amanda and I had the opportunity a couple of weeks ago to sneak into the last session of the marriage class. Uh, and they were talking through the five love languages. And so it's a good study. If you haven't been through it, go, go through it. Uh, they just finished it up here, but get it on your own. Read through it. And so we are looking at the five love languages, but Kyle always tells people that I have a sixth love language. And so my sixth love language is this, spreadsheets. I have a deep love of spreadsheets, and anybody who works with me gets them often, and I just had to figure out some way to put them in my sermon. So if you'll take a look at column A, I'm just kidding, we're not doing that, um, but uh, you know, I was trying to figure out as I came and spoke today and as I preached today, um, what could I say from my voice? What could I say from my seat, from my experiences um, that would speak to us this morning? And I decided not to preach on giving, and I decided not to preach using giant spreadsheets. So we had to figure out kind of where do I go from here? And um, I'm not a deep theologian. I'm not um, as witty, probably, as Kyle. You can already tell. Um, but I do have a unique seat and a unique perspective. And so I'm going to start off with something that earlier in the week wasn't in my sermon. But from my seat, I'm going to give you just a little bit of a building update. Okay? So we've actually had some exciting things happen in our building this week. Uh, up on top of VBS and all those exciting things particularly in the children's project. One of the things that's uh, been a massive issue in this process is the oil that leaked out of the elevator. If you don't know, our elevator was completely underwater. All the oil leaked out. It went under the foundation of our church into the soil. We had to uh, call the state and uh, do an environmental report. And this week, we got the all clear from the state and from the tests. So we could get close to moving forward here. We've been waiting on this for just under six months. And so we're thankful for that, thankful for the work that's been going on. We're very close to having all these finalized drawings to be able to present to the right people, send it out to bid, and bring you guys uh, some really concrete things for us to move forward as a church. So we're excited about that. Uh, we have opened... Uh, the fund, if you want to start giving towards the children's building, I know we haven't told you dollars amounts. We don't know them yet. But I'll tell you this, there are dollars associated with it. So feel free to go ahead and start giving if you'd like. We'll get you more information very soon. So we're very excited about that. Um, so just really quickly, there are some folks in the room that have known me a very long time. There are some folks in the room that I've never even met before. And so I'm just going to give you a very quick, who am I? And why am I standing on the stage today? Uh, just so that you know, when you see me running around the hall with a big giant ring of keys and, uh, you know, heading to look at something that's broken, who am I? So, first of all, uh, I am just a follower of Christ. I was saved as a kid. I was called into ministry as a young adult. Um, I spent 15 years as a bivocational minister of music. Uh, after that calling, uh, which that just means I had two jobs, and uh, one of those jobs was I was a minister of music. After that time, the Lord called us away. We didn't know where we were going to go, and we joined this church. Uh, that was seven years ago this month, and so we're excited about being here and serving here. Um, my other job was I came from the always exciting world of office supplies and office furniture, and so... It really is a lot more exciting than you think it is. But uh, that's, that's where I got my experience. That, I work for a company here in town, and they taught me all the business that I needed to know. 
And so I'm thankful for that. Um, I am married to Amanda, uh, my high school sweetheart. We, were, we started dating my senior year of high school. Oh, I totally agree. Hey, come on, people. <laughs> we were high school sweethearts. We surrendered to ministry together. We didn't have a clue at 18 and 17 years old what the Lord wanted for us or what the Lord was going to do with us. We just knew that if we were going to be together, we wanted to follow Him and see where that went. And so, uh, we've been serving in ministry side by side ever since. And so, we have our two daughters, Holly and Anna. Uh, they are, yes… They are 21 and 18, and we're ex heading into a new phase of life uh, of two college kids. Uh, so, and that fund is always open. If you would like to, if you'd like to contribute towards that, then we would we would love to. Hey, that was for Tyson, that that corny joke there. So he said, "Hey, you got to put in a lame joke in your sermon." And so there you go. Uh, but really, that's that's who I am. I'm a proud dad. I'm a husband. I serve. And I, and I just love to follow Christ. So I want to tell you why I do what I do. And um, what I do, um, there's a technical answer. I have a long job description. Uh, the not-so-technical answer is the answer that I give everyone. I work at the church at Quail Creek, and I do finances, and I do building, and I do vehicles, and I do operation, and I do all the rest of the stuff that the other pastors don't want to do. They pass it towards me, and, and we just make it happen. So that is the official job description of what do I do. And so, but what I really try to do here is make us better. I try to make this place better. We are uh, broken people, and sometimes we're all doing our best, but we tend to trip on each other and trip on ourselves. And I just try to figure out ways to get out ahead of that and make us not do it quite so often so that we can move forward with the gospel and just get out of our own way. And so, um, that, those are the things that I really do here in the church. Um, so, let me tell you a little bit about why I do it. Let me tell you about why I do uh, what I do. And that's one simple sentence. I love the church. I love our church. I love serving here. If you don't have a church home, there's a great place to be. I also love the church. I love the church of Jesus Christ. I love the opportunity to make us better so that we can then in turn help other people so that if we have something good that we're doing, we can bless other churches, we can help them along the way, we can do all kinds of things because I believe that the church is still God's greatest weapon in our fight against Satan. And so Ephesians 6 says this, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, and the cosmic powers of the darkness, against evil spiritual forces in heaven. You know, I believe that we're still in that battle and that we do that battle better together. And so that's why I love the church. I also love the church because Christ himself loved the church. In Ephesians 5, earlier on, it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church, and he gave himself for. Amen. You know, if Christ himself loves the church, we should too. And so that's, that's another reason that I love the church. This is a little personal note of why I love the church. And those of you that are sitting in this room that have served in ministry and that are serving in ministry or have through the years can attest to this. When you serve in ministry and you serve in churches like this, uh, it's a blessing and it's a blessing to you. It's a blessing to your family. Uh, when you, well, I was hired as a music minister the day before my 21st birthday. Here's what you don't know at age 20. A lot. And so when I got, I have no idea why they hired me, honestly. Uh, but they let us learn and grow and figure it out. And they came alongside us, and sometimes they gave us food because we were broke. Sometimes they gave us money. Sometimes they gave us encouragement. Sometimes they had a little talk with us saying, mm, no, not us. This is me. They had a little talk with me uh, saying, yeah, that might not have been the best idea. Uh, don't try that again. <laughs> but if you're serving in ministry, 
there's a, a uniqueness about it. And that goes on still to this day. There are people in this room that, and I've seen it all morning long, people coming up and just going, hey, praying for you today. Hey, I'm excited about what's going to happen today. Hey, I just wanted to tell you. Or there's people who come by my office every single week and go, need anything? Or how's it going? How you doing? So for those of you that serve us as we serve you, thank you. And keep it up because we desperately need it as, as your staff. And so uh, that's one of the reasons that I really love the church. I had a point three, and I didn't know how to get there, and so I'm going to take you on a journey with point two out here. It doesn't seem like it makes sense in the flow of things, but I want to take you on it. I wanted to go, one of the questions I wrestled with in my sermon was, what does the church need? You know, I wanted to stand up here and go, hey, let me tell you what the church needs. It's a lot, I'll just say that. But then I got back a little bit further and was like, well, what does God need from us? What does God need? Not the church, but God. What's he need from us? What's he need from Craig, who's sitting in his office? What's he need from you guys? That took me back a little further to, does he need anything? Does God need anything at all? So, I went to the scriptures, and um, Psalms 115 says this, Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name, give glory because of your faithful love, because of your truth. Amen. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven, and he does whatever he pleases. When I was a kid, and we would go in, and we didn't agree with mom or dad, uh, I would say, why? And my mom would say, because I, so. I said so. Absolutely. I've used that line so many times. It's a good one. Sometimes we don't agree with what God says. Right there. Because he said so. Because he's God and he does what he pleases. If you'd open your Bibles to Acts chapter 17 this morning. Open your Bibles. Open your Bible app. It'll be on the screen. Acts chapter 17, verse 22. So I'm fascinated with people like Kyle and people like Dale and people who can uh, do a very specific thing. My gifting is not this. I am not super creative. I am not um, a big, giant picture. I can see the big picture, but I see it in a million little details. Kyle always says, I go from A to Z, and Craig tells me what B through Y is and how we get there. Uh, and so that's me. I, I, don't, I don't see that. But there are people like Kyle and people that walk through different places and all of a sudden see something and go, oh, man, I could make a 12-part sermon series out of that. Or, oh, man, that is good. That is, oh, yeah, that'll preach all day long. I'm not that kind of guy. Paul, that's what he was doing here. Paul's walking through Athens, and uh, um, he's walking through Athens, and there's all these statues, and he's just looking, and I can just imagine him walking through going, <laughs> I'm about to say something, something. I don't know what it is, but it's about to go down, and I'm going to say something profound, whatever it's going to be. And he's walking through going, all right, Lord, what do I say? And then right there, verse 20, chapter 17, verse 22, it says, Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that you're extremely religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which, inscribed to an un, uh, which was inscribed to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the heaven, uh, the world and everything in it, he is the Lord of the heaven and earth, and he does not live in shrines made by hands, neither is he served by human hands as though he needs anything, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. From one man he's made every nationality to live over the whole earth, 
and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he's not far from each of us. So he's walking through and he sees this statue and he's like, oh, hey, look, bing, there it is. I got my idea. He says, hey, you guys are worshiping all these things. I want to tell you who you're worshiping. I, I'm going to tell you about this God that you don't even know. But he's not a God like the other gods, that he's served by human hands. Verse 24 there, the God who made the world and everything in it, he is the Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in shrines made by hand. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives everyone life and breath. But why? Why does he let us be apart? Why does he let us take a look at different things? Verse 27 says it. He did this so they might seek God. And perhaps they might reach out and find him. Though he's not far from each of us. You know, when you look at the, the gospel, and this is going to lead me into my, my point here. When you look at the gospel and you look at God, and you do this study of God, sometimes we forget who God is and what he really is all about. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need anything. In fact, the only reason that he tells us that he allows us to be a part of this thing is that so that we might seek him and find him. And people go on all these journeys and people go on all these quests to find God. And right there he says, well, I'm not very far from you. And so, uh, you know, I'm going to give you an assignment here today. I'm going to give you a challenge. If you want to spend some time in your Bible this week, I did a study um, uh, this week, and, and I want to challenge you to do the same. Go to Bible Gateway. Go to your concordance, go to your Bible tool, whatever it is, and put in these words, the Lord is. Right? And then just spend some time going through that. It's amazing what you'll find. The Lord is our rock, our fortress, our strong tower. The Lord's our comfort, our peace, the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is one. He's good. He's gracious. He's righteous. The Lord is great. He's mighty. The Lord is pure. This one might be my favorite. The Lord is with you. Isn't that amazing? So you want to spend some time in your Word this week, in your Bible this week? Every day. Go look one up. And if it's the Lord is good, just say, God, your Word says you are good. Help me to see that today. Help me to find it today. Help me to live in that today. And if we did nothing but that for a couple of weeks, I think it would change our lives. And so that takes me to the last thing. Here's why I love the church. If God is a God that needs nothing, if God is a God that doesn't need us in the least bit, but he gives us a chance to join him in this thing, why wouldn't we? You know, if God is a God that needs absolutely nothing from us, but he gives us a chance to join in his work and to join him, this is the greatest plan in history. This is history. And he gave us the chance to join him and to walk in his work and to join him in the greatest thing ever made. I want to be a part of that. And so I, I would hope that you would too. Then God, in all his goodness, goes even one step further. He says, hey, you can join me. You should come. It's going to be great. We're going to change the world, you and me. But it's not that you've got to just come. By the way, I gave you gifts, and I gave you talents, and I gave you everything that you would need in that journey. So that you don't just come along and watch. You get to be a part and you get to really make a difference in this process. In 1 Corinthians 12 it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be unaware. Verse 4, Now there are different gifts but the same Spirit. 
There are different ministries, but the same Lord. There are different activities, but the same God works, all of them in each person. A manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. And then he just goes on and lists some. To one is given a message of wisdom, a message of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith. To another, the gifts of healing. To another, the performing of miracles. To another, prophecy. Distinguishing between spirits, different kinds of tongues, interpretations of tongues. And I mean, this is a small list, right? One and the same spirit is active in all of these, distributing to each person as he wills. Remember, I'm God. I can do it. I can do whatever I want. Paul then goes on or earlier in chapter 7, and he says this, I wish that all people were as I am. But each one has his own gift from God. One person has this gift and another has that. So we get to be part of this. I mean, God is is allowing us to be a part of what he's doing. He's allowing us to be a part of all this stuff. And he's given us gifts, talents, abilities specifically to to do that with. And so uh, that, to me, is exciting. And so when you look at it, to me, that is the work of the church. That is absolutely the work of the church. We are the church that he's called to do that. Um, We do a lot of things that I feel like are the workings of the church, right? We plan worship services. We plan Bible studies. We plan VBSs. We call people who call us asking for some counsel and prayer. We call those of you that are new and say, thanks for coming. We call those who are missing. We try to visit in the hospital. These are all things that happen in the church. That's why you guys hire us as staff, right? But when it comes to, um, when it comes to our job as far as the work of the church, uh, our instructions are very clear as your staff. We are, in Ephesians 4, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. So, what do we do? We're here to just get all of us, me, y'all, everybody ready for the work of the ministry. And so when we come into that, you know, we collectively are the church. And so when you sit in our seat as leadership of the church, you know, that's just, that's what we're here for. And so um, I, I just, I, that leads me to a few questions here. When we are working, uh, when we are the church, you are the church and I am the church, there's a few final questions that I think we should ask. Here's the most important question. Are you a part of the church? Not the church at Quail Creek, although we want every one of you to feel comfortable enough to call this your home and to plug in and to serve and to do all those things. The church of Christ, the church of Jesus. And all that means is we're a group of people who have the same faith. We all trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior and trust him to lead us. That's all that is. So are you a part of that church? If not, today's the day. Christ came. He gave himself for all of us uh, because we needed a Savior. And so uh, if you don't know about that, you're not sure, you want to, I mean, come talk to us here in a minute. We'd love to share that with you. Um, The next thing, what are some of my gifts and talents? God has gifted every single person in him with gifts and talents. Have you ever studied it? Have you ever tried to figure that out? I mean, what are your passions? What are you passionate about that the Lord might use. If you don't know that, let's, let's just think. 
the God in heaven who needs nothing gives us a chance to be a part of it. Why wouldn't we want to? And why would we go in there? There's nothing worse than going to a place and standing there because you have absolutely no idea what's going on and standing there because you have absolutely no clue what to do. And uh, God's given you unique things to go, (laughs) join in. It's in your nature. I gave it to you. So do you know what some of those gifts and talents are? There's different ways to figure that out. And if you don't know, we'd love to talk to you about that. There's spiritual gift surveys. There are studies. There are all kinds of ways we can figure, help you figure out kind of what your unique gifts and passions are. The third thing is if you know what you're a part of the body of Christ and you know what those gifts and talents are, what's the Lord calling you to do with it? What's he calling you to do? He did not give anybody gifts and talents um, for no reason. He gave everybody those gifts and talents to be a part and to serve. And so if you're not, you don't know, it's time to ask him, God, what do you want me to do? Because I want to be a part of the church that's growing and moving. And then the last thing is, if you know what it is, are you being faithful to it? Scripture says, to him who knows what to do and doesn't do it, it's sin. And sin separates us from God, and that's not where I want to be. I hope that's your prayer, too. So if you don't know whether you're a part of that body of Christ, you don't know what your gifts and talents are, you don't know whether what he's calling you to do with it, or you're just in this moment going, yeah, I know. Listen, I was 18 years old by like three days when I surrendered to the ministry. Amen. So, it, guys, students over here, the Lord may be calling you in your life to surrender to putting yourself in God's service. He might be calling you to missions. He might be calling some of us to missions, to go and to proclaim Christ all across the world or around the corner. He might be calling you to start a Bible study at your work or to do some one-on-one discipleship with your coworkers right there where you work out in the commercial world. He's calling each one of us to do something. And so the question is, are you being faithful? So we're going to have a time. Um, all right, one more scripture. First Peter says this, Just as each one has received a gift, Use it to serve others as good stewards of the varied grace of God. If anyone speaks, let it be as one who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, let it be from the strength that God provides, so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. We're going to have a time of invitation. We're gonna, our, our team's going to come up and they're going to sing. Um, Mark and Dale and myself and John will be down here. Uh, If you want to pray with somebody, you want to go through some of those questions, we'd love to visit with you. If you don't know Christ, we would pray that today would be the day. I mean, we earnestly pray all week long that we would see people come to to salvation. And so if that's you today, uh, maybe you just need to spend a little time with the Lord. Maybe you need to come down and and, uh, just spend some time with Him and go, God, I don't I don't know what it is you want me to do, or I don't know what I'm good at, or I don't know who I am even. And so let's spend some time preparing our hearts um, uh, to just go from this place as the church, as one church, ready to make a difference. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for our pastor Thank you for the opportunity for him to go and and to grow and to uh, experience uh, where you walked and 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 live. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to stand here in this place and to open your word. God, thank you for your word and the the uh, challenge that it brings us. Uh, God, thank you for the opportunity to to hear you speak to us. Lord, we want to be faithful. We want to know you. God, if anybody's here this morning that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray you would tug on their hearts today. Lord, I pray that your spirit would be 
so drawing that, Lord, they just couldn't help but draw to you. Lord, I pray for those that are running in here this morning, or some are running from something you're calling them to do. Some are running from those gifts and talents that you've given them. Lord, I pray that you would do a work in in their lives. Father, I pray you would help every single one of us to spend some time with you throughout this week, throughout this morning, to just draw near to you. And Lord, allow you to just speak in our lives. Speak to our hearts now, Lord, and give us the courage, the strength, and the wisdom to follow. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.